Organizations have invested a lot of money to simplify the customer experience by introducing self-service and other channels to meet the customers where they are. But this shift has in many ways made the work of customer service teams more difficult while creating a disjointed experience across channels for customers. Hi, everyone. My name is Jim Malone. I'm a senior content strategist working with CIO Marketing Services. And welcome to this webcast brought to you by Salesforce. In this session, we're going to hear from a pair of experts who will offer essential guidance on adding AI to service operations. We'll explore how artificial intelligence can help improve both the customer and agent experience and how to drive a single pane of glass across service channels and help agents better understand customers and resolve their issues while reducing the time spent researching customer issues, among other benefits. We've got a lot to cover, so let's meet our speakers without further ado. First, let's say hello to Deborah Stusenberg, who's VP for Product Management with Salesforce. Hi, Deborah. Welcome. Tell us about your role at Salesforce. Hi. Thank you so much. Uh, great to be here with everyone. Um, I am leading our service platform area of Service Cloud. Um, that is our case management, incident management, knowledge management, self-service, um, collaboration, and now infusing all of that with um, with AI, which we have been on that journey for quite a long time. But of course, there's been so much opportunity in the last you know, year to really um, accelerate on that journey that we've been on for so long. Thanks so much, Deborah. Delighted you could be with us. And yes, it is a really, really opportune time to talk about AI in this domain. So looking forward to your comments today. Now let's greet Tim Watt, Tim's partner with PwC. Hi, Tim, glad you could be with us. Tell us about your work at PwC. Hi, hi Jim, uh, super excited to be here with you and Deborah today. I lead PwC's uh, Salesforce transformation, uh, service transformation practice. You know, I, I spend a lot of my time working with organizations, you know, helping them deliver better customer experience, uh, you know, leveraging technology, right. To do that. So, you know, I've, I've been in this space for, for 20 years and, and really excited to our conversation. Excellent, Tim. Thanks so much for being with us. Yeah. We're looking forward to it too. It's really a, a great topic. And to help you get the most out of today's session, I just want to quickly point out the additional resources section of your player. There you can find lots of great resources from our sponsor, from our panelists that you can download, share with colleagues, friends, customers, prospects to do a really deep dive on this topic today. So we do encourage you to take advantage of that. As I mentioned, we've got a lot of information to cover today. So let's dive right in. I'm going to start with you, Tim, and let's take a kind of an overview of some of the current challenges that you're seeing uh, emerge uh, with customer service today before we dive into the kind of meat of the discussion about AI. What are some of the, the biggest challenges that you're noticing? I, I think there's three big things that I'm seeing today, Jim. You know, if we start off uh, first, you know, I, th I think a lot of brands have fallen short in delivering this omni-channel experience we've all all been focused on over the past decade plus, right? While, while they've increased their channel offerings, they've also increased the friction points that, that customers face you know, navigating those various channels, you know, and this has, has caused issues both for, for customer effort and agent effort, um, you know, to deliver that best experience. So, so that's number one. Second, the definition of service has expanded beyond the contact center, you know, whether it be field service or frontline associates, you know, for, for retail, that would be the in-store associates or hospitality. That could be your front desk associates, right? You know, service applies to all of the above now. And, you know, customers really expect that, you know, you're, whether you're in the call center or you're at the desk of a hotel, you're delivering that same personalized experience. And then the, the final challenge that I see today is we already have, you know, existing fragmentation of data technology channels. And that's only getting compounded uh, with the introduction of AI and solution-specific AI models. Uh, again, this we talked about it earlier, like the increase in friction. This is only then like supercharge that friction, you know, causing a more disjointed experience.
work for customers as they they look for to be serviced by their yeah. So Deborah, those were a few of the challenges that I'm seeing from my my end. Like what are you seeing um from your point of view? Yeah, I agree with everything that you said. Um seeing the same as well as um service organizations are really being challenged to do more with less. That's not new news. They've they've kind of always been in that boat, but um we're seeing that our many of our customers are facing, you know, increasing customer expectation, um, increasing complexity of problems that they need to solve, and increasing pressure to be more operationally efficient and effective um, and drive down costs, which is, you know, a, a, a tall challenge to um, to be able to meet all of those at the same time. And, you know, additionally, customers really want to be able to get service um, wherever they most want to um, interact. So whether that's mobile, um, if it, they want to go to a self-service portal, um, they want the same experience and the same information um, via voice. You know, as you mentioned before, you know, the omni channel expectations are high and customers expect to be able to get the information they need to be able to transact with companies wherever they are most comfortable or where they are in the moment and need that service. So Deborah, you just got me thinking as you were talking through those challenges. Um, you know, we we typically think about how we deliver consistent experiences across the various channels, but at the same time, we all know that different issues are better suited for for different channels. Yeah. Like how how do you think about how we bring those two sort of like different thoughts together? Yeah, I I I definitely agree with what you're saying. I think the important thing is we may, I may have said um, that they we need to deliver the same service. And really, really a better way to say that, and I'm glad you asked this question, a really be- better way is to say the same level of service. So, you know, if there's a different kind of problem that's better suited for a phone call or a, a text message or, you know, wherever the customer is in the moment that they need that service, they need the same level of care um, to meet the need of whatever it is that they have in that moment. So, if they're, you know, working at their desktop and they're, you know, in a browser and they reach out to a company that way, they expect the same level of um, responsiveness and the same level of accuracy in information if they're somewhere out on their day and they're texting uh, a company or um, reaching out in some other mechanism. So I think the thing that's most important is to realize that when it's a real-time channel, it is most likely something that's urgent and they need a response in that moment. They can't really wait, you know, or if they can, there is always that opportunity to say, hey, can we follow up with you? But um, I think expectations are usually high that if they're reaching out on a real time channel, that the expectation is they're going to get an answer quickly. Um, so, yeah, I think you're you're absolutely right in asking that question. And that's what I'm seeing. So think about those some of those challenges, Deborah, that we just kind of outlined. You know, the, we're still seeking omni-channel utopia, so to speak. Some of the resource constraints. Tim mentioned that kind of everyone is a customer service agent now. How? What are some of the ways AI is being applied to address some of these challenges from your point of view? Yeah, um, I think that the important thing to note is service is one of the most um, put the, mo- the largest areas of potential disruption with AI. And so it's really important for us to think about the ways um, to use AI to be most effective in service. And, and that changes from channel to channel or even in each use case um, of what somebody is expecting out of it. So, you know, before I was talking about kind of driving down um, the, com- the, the, the ways to deal with increasing complexity and customer demand, um, what they what we need to use AI for is different depending on that channel and depending on the urgency of what somebody's looking for. So, for example, if somebody's on a website and they're looking, you know, for information, uh, they may be happy to have something that sort of summarizes and provides a good answer, um, so that they don't have to dig through uh, lots of information through in a website to find the information that they're looking for. That cuts down on the customer effort to get you know, the answer that they're looking for. Um, If they're reaching out on a voice channel or on a messaging channel, then, you know, they need the response. If it's a bot, they need that bot to have access to the information that they would have gotten from speaking directly to a service, somebody in their service team. 
So the you know it's frustrating for them when they you know reach out to the bot and the bot kind of doesn't have access to the relevant information to provide the right answer. Um, similarly, you know if they're on an uh, an interaction with uh, somebody in the service team, whether it's through voice or through messaging, they need the same information there um, available, and they need that that service agent to be able to respond quickly and provide an accurate answer. So if we think about the way that we can use AI in that, you know, we can have AI help to summarize information on a web portal. We can have AI help to provide recommendations on the best next steps to take um, so that the, the user doesn't have to dig in and try to figure that out for themselves. If we have an interaction with a bot, we need to make sure the bot is, you know, tapped into all of the right relevant information to be able to provide um, accurate contextual, per, you know, personalized responses that is going to help the, the the user with what they're looking for. And if it's a direct conversation with an agent, they also need information at their fingertips, recommending to them how to answer those questions so that they're, you know, reducing the amount of time and interaction with the end user as much as possible and getting them those answers as quickly as possible without having to struggle and without having to, you know, say, hey, can we call you back or, you know, um, try to provide the in information later. Tim, what are you seeing with that? I, I, I'm sure you're you're um, getting a lot of questions around this from your customers. Yeah. So like one thing that's top of mind is a recent customer loyalty survey that we conducted here at PwC that found that 32% of respondents um, stopped doing business with a company because of like a bad customer service experience. Um, and we really have to consider that, right, as we look to implement AI and Gen AI out in the, the context center and beyond, right? You know, it, it's not a silver bullet. As, as you mentioned, Deborah, right, like there's like plenty of opportunity to for, for an AI to provide a poor customer experience. And we have to think about that starting on day one, right? You know, before we roll these technologies out, we have to have that holistic plan um, to, you know, ensure that that quality experience for our customers. So, so that's the first point. The, the second thing I think about when you were talking about like enhancing the agent experience, I, I go back to one of my airline clients who graced the Dreamforce stage a few years ago. And it was interesting for how, how they thought about their success met metrics for their service transformation. You know, they're a very customer focused organization and you think, Hey, customer service, we're going to have like KPIs that are all around customer satisfaction and, and things along those lines. But actually the KPI that they built the program around was around like employee satisfaction. And, and that was, you know, you know, a great insight into that. Like it's the employees on the other end of the phone, right? The agents who are the ones delivering that great customer experience. And without that, you know, it's not going to be a good experience at the end of the day. Right. Yeah. And, and so I think when you talked about how AI could enhance or augment that, that agent experience, I think that's where we're going to see, you know, the most value, you know, in the next year, year or two, you know, like helping like break down those friction points for the agent, you know, leveraging knowledge that, um, and synthesizing that or cutting down on their after call work, right? That's, I think, going to be where we get the most value out of, you know, Gen AI, you know, in 2024. Tim, as we think about the, the metrics that you just mentioned, Devers mentioned the single pane of glass, let's, let's focus in on some of the practical approaches that you're seeing emerge for AI for service. So Jim, let's talk about that single pane of glass, right? Like that's a con concept that's been in the contact center, you know, for a while now, right? Where we're bringing to the forefront for the agent, right? Like everything there is to know, you know, about the person who, who's calling them, right? And if we tie that back to one of the challenges I discussed earlier, right? Like the, the broader definition of service. You know, I, I think one of the practical approaches for AI is like, how do we expand that single pane of glass to, you know, our frontline associates, to our field service agents, 
right? And give them the relevant information that they need in bite-sized chunks to like deliver personalized service when somebody's right in front of you, right? So, you know, I, I think Gen AI has like a, a huge, there's a huge opportunity for Gen AI, AI in that regard, right? Like think about, you know, a front desk agent at a hotel. Currently you walk in, you might've stayed there last week. You might've stayed there 10 times, right? And they treat you like it's your first time checking into the hotel, right? What if Gen AI right on their, their screen while you check in was able to synthesize some of their experiences, you know, in, in a bite-sized way, right? Where they could just say, Hey, Mr. Watt, you know, thanks for staying here again. Right. And, and maybe comment on, you know, you like to go to the gym or, or based upon some other information that's in the, in the system. And so I, I, I think Gen AI is like one of the, you know, opportunities there as we look to, to expand, you know, that personalized service to the front desk. Um, you know, we're, we're actually doing something along those lines at, at a hospitality client right now, you know, so it's something near and dear to my heart and, and, you know, hopefully will elevate the, the guest experience. Um, along those lines, there's this concept in, in marketing called digital. Um, it's, it's a weird term, but it, it's really talking about the combination of digital and in-person experiences and right. That that's really relevant to what we're seeing in the, in the service industry. Um, so I, again, like bringing these ideas for marketing, whether it's like personalized communications, right. Or marketing campaigns and, and bringing them forward to service interactions. Um, you know, whether it be on the phone, in person, et cetera. Um, I think there's a lot that we can learn and like a lot of, a lot of that in the marketing space is being driven through AI, right? So I, I think there's things we can learn, right? Salesforce is leveraging data cloud to bring a lot of that data together, both for the agents and the AI models that are, are leveraging that data. Yeah, Tim, I love what you're talking about around the single pane of glass. Um, I, I think that that concept has been around for a long time. And the interesting thing now, as we're you know seeing how we can shift the experience, especially for service teams to deliver great experiences, thinking about that single pane of glass, if we if we look at what many of our customers have done with that, it's it's often there's so much information now on the screen um, that the, you know, the service teams have to process quickly and understand where to look and what should I focus on first and what should I focus on now? And I think the important thing about what you're saying and, and, you know, what we're, how we're evolving our thinking around service is let's have access to actually even more information about, um, the customer that somebody's working with, understand in, you know, all of the interactions that they've had with the company and the brand, understand what's important to them. What have they done in the past that would influence the way that this particular interaction should, you know, be handled? But bring that to surface in the context of what they need in that moment, um, and and so maybe not have an overloaded single pane of glass that has all the information there that you have to then, you know, rely on your service teams to figure out where to where should I look first and how do I figure out what to do next? But surface that, you know, contextually and dynamically as that as that uh, service agent needs it to deliver the experience that the customer wants at that moment. So are they originally greeting them? Great. Give them, you know, those, those personalized touches that you're talking about. Um, are they now, you know, if, in, a, if, in the hospitality um, example that you gave, are they now kind of deeper into the process and they're trying to figure out, you know, uh, which room to select to put them in? Do, now we need to know like where, where are they in, um, you know, are they a, a, a platinum customer that has stayed there, you know, a hundred nights over the last year. Um, and, you know, is there any preferences about the kind of room that they are looking for or something that they could do that's, you know, personalizing that experience in the moment. Um, and I think that is becoming so much easier with AI, you know, at the forefront. So instead of, again, loading that experience, that single pane of glass with all of the information and relying on the agent to, or hospitality, um, you know, 
concierge to figure that out on their on their own in that moment. Um, with AI, we can surface it you know as it's needed. I think that's really exciting. Hey, hey, Dever, like one question that you got me thinking about: um, Are the KPIs we we've, we've leveraged in the past like are do they work in this moment as we sort of like talk about AI and like personalization? Like I think about, you know, HT as a metric, you know, that's near and dear t- to the contact center manager's heart, right? Like, is that the right metric we should be focusing on going forward or, or should we be thinking about it differently? Yeah, I definitely think our metrics are going to evolve. Service metrics have stayed the same, you know, for, for many, many years for the most part. Um, but as AI is able to handle more and more of the easier um, answers for for end users and even automating tasks that maybe a tier one, you know, or help center agent would have so- would have done for a customer, the work that comes into the service organization is going to get harder and harder, which means average handle time is going to be important, but we shouldn't be surprised if we see that go up. We have to sort of balance that out with, okay, how much of the work that's coming in is brand new problems, complex problems, things that haven't been solved before. So it is going to take more time. And, you know, now we need to look at things like, were were we able to leverage AI to get the information that's needed to help troubleshoot that in the most efficient way in the moment? Um, And, you know, shifting, kind of thinking about like, oh, if the, the average handle time goes up, uh, that just means that, you know, the, the, the agent has done a bad job. That may not be the case. If, if they're dealing with harder problems on a regular basis, then we need to really look at, you know, were they able to solve, um, were they able to still solve that problem faster than they would have prior to having AI at their fingertips? So, you know, just need to shift our thinking in that a little bit. Yep. Do you think there's any other metrics like, you know, we talked about handle time there, but, you know, some other important metrics I think about are like the onboarding time, right? Like how, how long does it take to get a new agent ready to take calls? How should we be thinking about that with like the introduction of like all these AI technologies? Yeah. I mean, onboarding has always been a really important metric for service organizations, right? If they, if it takes, uh, if it takes weeks to get somebody to be uh, proficient enough to be able to take a call, then um, that can can really impact the ability for this service organization to be effective. And so, you know, with AI, actually, we would expect that that could come down quite significantly because they can leverage. Um, if you have your AI plugged into your, you know, knowledge, your um, documentation, all of the sources of information that are vetted and trusted information about your service and, and, and products, um, then you know, if the quality is high on that information and you have a process for continuing to evolve it and provide more information in, you know, in your knowledge base, in your documentation, all of the sources of information that you would use with AI to get those answers, then onboarding should go down significantly because now uh, a new, somebody that's new to the support organization would be able to tap into all of that collective expertise and wisdom and experience right away to get um, a really solid answer for their customer, or we would be able to automate kind of knowing what action to take and even automate how to, to actually take that action and surface that dynamically in the moment. So, you know, onboarding should be significantly driven down. One interesting example from one of my clients is they've actually invested in an AI for, for training, like training calls, right? Um, so they're ac- actually able to, you know, agents will go through hundreds of calls with the Gen AI bot and, you know, get all that like real world type experience before they actually talk to a customer for the first time. And I, I found that like fascinating, you know, they've been using it for over a year and, you know, put that on top of, you know, Gen AI for knowledge, you know, synthesizing knowledge. Right. And those two factors alone, you know, you would imagine would greatly reduce the important time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we, you know, we're seeing a, a, if, a, a resurgence of people's interest in understanding how to do knowledge management well, which is critically important. Um, you know, that is where you're going to 
have your trusted information about your business that's dynamic, hopefully, <laughs> and dynamically being updated, you know, as uh, new problems are being solved or if the business is evolving. And, you know, and that um, accurate source of information is so critical as a grounding mechanism for, you know, Gen AI to be able to take action for you or to pro provide those great recommendations. Um, and so we, we have a lot of customers coming to us now and asking, you know, like, what's the best way to make sure that my knowledge, um, my knowledge management systems and the, the, the information that we're going to use with Gen AI is accurate and up to date and um, available to, to be able to be used for that. So um, it's a really good point that you're raising. Yeah, and just as a fellow of Devra, is it and Tim, is it fair to say too when you think about AI's capability with with training and with onboarding that that can be a step toward helping uh, in an industry where there's some significant churn and also with retention, uh, employee retention? Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I I will I'll jump in on this one. I mean, I think that. Um, service org organizations are known to typically have high turnover rates. Um, so it's really important when you, especially when you have experts in your business to, you know, leverage the learnings that they have figured out along the way. Um, it, it's it's not in any business's best interest to only have one person in the business understand how to solve a problem. And, you know, one of the key things to, I think that what they struggle with is then, um, that expert often feels like their worth is in the information that they know. And the important thing is to be able to give them that opportunity to understand your information that you know now is useful now. So let's make sure it's it's captured and available for everyone to leverage. And let's use your expertise to help you grow with our business, solve new problems, get exposed to new areas of the business, you know, and and continue to grow in their own career. And that helps the organization to be more successful. It helps the newer people that come on board be more su successful, but also it gives that expert an opportunity to grow. So they're less likely to turn over and look for something else that's more challenging because it gets boring for them to continue to just answer the same questions over and over. Yep. If, if I could add on to that, you know, I joke that like most service professionals wear capes, right? Like they're all superheroes. Um, it, it requires a lot of knowledge, you know, both about like the profession overall, but also like the the nitty gritty details of how your company works to be good at it, right? And, and that's only part of the job, right? Like you got to deal with often irate customers calling in that have no patience, right? So it's like you have all these like different skill sets <laughs> that you got to be like perfect at. And if I just come back to that airline example of like employee like experience as like a driving factor. If, if we could just like make one of those things a little bit easier for them, like it goes a, a long way, right? And it, if it's just like helping them get access to the knowledge they need when they need it, right? Like I, I think that's going to be a multiplier, right? When, when we start looking at customer satisfaction. Yeah, 100%. I think, I think one thing to just kind of, you know, take a little further as well, I totally agree with you. You know, definitely um, service service teams need to be a, a group of people with capes. Um, one of the things that's really important in an environment that's evolving with AI is to remember that now that the problems are getting harder, if we can use AI for customers to self-serve more effectively um, and service organizations are dealing with harder problems or newer problems more often, uh, it one of the other factors of this that's going to become really important is good collaboration. The ability to reach out, to know how to reach out to the right people, pull people together to kind of brainstorm something and solve a problem together when it is something new and, um, and you know, the, the service agent that is uh, on the, the hot seat at the moment, it doesn't know how to take it further. They're going to need to know how to reach out and how to collaborate effectively with anyone else in the business that has the expertise. That could be in service and it could be outside of service. So they, they, they really need to be able to tap into the expertise around the organization. And we need to um, help organizations build a collaboration culture so that, you know, we they can more easily bring the right experts together, bring the right people together to solve problems. And then out of that resolution, turn that into something reusable, turning it in, into something that's 
knowledge that can be tapped into by AI when a problem like that is solved in the future. Um, so that kind of heavy collaboration of pulling people together isn't needed the next time that that kind of problem is is um, comes up again. But uh, you know, with harder problems comes the need to not only be the hero on your own, but to tap into the expertise around the organization as well, which again, could be within the service organization or even beyond. We've been chatting with Tim Watt with PwC, Deborah Stusenberg with Salesforce. Folks, we have a few minutes left in our session today. And before we go, I really wanted to turn toward the future and get your ideas and uh, not so much predictions, but just kind of an idea of what you see as some of the possibilities as we look forward to a future that is definitely going to include generative AI and other versions of AI as well. So let's take a couple minutes to do that before we close. And Tim, I'd like to start with you. Let's let's get our crystal balls out and look a little bit into the future. Yes. So, you know, I would start with like what's in front of us in 2024, maybe before we get beyond that. And like, I, I think that the future now, right, is around an augmented experience, you know, for our agents where we like start to dip our toes into, you know, putting Gen AI out there for our customers, right? Like all brands are very concerned about like managing that experience and losing the control, you know, with your Gen AI model is something like most companies aren't ready for yet, right? So I think 2024 is going to see, you know, lots of projects around, you know, service replies or work summaries, all these like capabilities to, to make things better for the agents. And then I think 25 and beyond, once we sort of learn those lessons is where we'll start to see them applied in mass, um, you know, customer facing. But again, I, I think we got to be pragmatic about it. We got to like go back to some of the points we've been talking about before. It's like, it's not technology for technology's sake, right? It's like making sure we're thinking holistically around what is the right experience for each channel? How does AI complement that, you know, as a tool in our toolbox, you know, it's not the only solution, right? So I don't know, Dever, what do you think? Um, yeah, I agree that, you know, I think many organizations we have, and we are seeing some organizations that are ahead of the curve and are really kind of pushing the envelope on what they're comfortable with, uh, you know, exploring with AI. I think that the vast majority are trying to get comfortable with, um, with as you said, like what is the agent experience with it? How do I know that I can trust it? Um, let me make sure that it's providing the right answers and information that I, you know, that I know I can trust to share it with my my customers and feel confident in that. Um, and so often that is based internally first, um, so that it can be vetted and and you know we can have kind of a human in the loop to validate that before it goes out to a customer. There are another a, a number of areas where it still can be f customer facing now. Um, so, you know, summarizing information on a self-service portal or through a bot or through um, uh, a, a mobile engagement. I think that kind of information, just taking information that a, a, a user would have found anyway, but summarizing it in a way that's easily digestible um, and doesn't and reduces the the need for the end user to search and kind of dig through all of the responses that you know all of the answers that come back um, or maybe different documents and articles and you know content. I think summarizing content tends to be an area that more companies are more comfortable with putting in you know customer facing probably sooner than later. I think that as this ships to taking more action, uh, that's where we're seeing companies wanting to try that out more internally first. So not only having AI provide answers and summarizing up and distilling information into something that's easily digestible, but then also recommending the next actions and steps to take and even automating that that action. Um, I think that's where we're seeing, you know, a lot of interest, uh, exponentially um, potential for, you know, helping drive efficiency into organizations. But I definitely am seeing, you know, we're seeing in our in our conversations with customers that they want to try that first internally um, and make sure that those actions are, you know, something that it's actually bringing up, it's surfacing the right actions. And when we automate that, it's, um, you know, engaging in the right way. So um, 
I agree with you that that you know the internal focus is critically important first. I will say that um, one additional thought on that is to have any of those experiences be you know be well uh, I don't know a solid experience be something that that our customers are are confident in. We still have to remember that it has to be based on information that's accurate. So you can't just point it at can't point AI at every conversation that happens and, you know, all of the information on the web and internally in all of your systems and assume that it's going to know when information there is accurate or not accurate. So you have to be kind of mindful and, and thoughtful about what information is going to be used for what circumstances to drive, to make sure that you're driving the right answers into that AI experience. Um, and same thing as we start to, you know, surface actions, right? We need to have information there that's going to say, this is the right action to take in this moment or for this kind of customer. Um, so, you know, driving qu information quality is going to be critically important. Yep. And, and just one last thing on that point, Deborah, and yeah. it's going to require like changes to the organization, right? Like it's not a technology where we roll out and we're done. Right? right. Like we have to yeah. continually monitor and in in enhance that model, right? Like make sure the data sources are correct, right? Like if, if you roll out a bot and then you don't touch it for another year, right? Like there's gonna be tons of things you're missing that are driving dissatisfaction, right? So we gotta make sure we we change our organizations to like, you know, not not only focus on getting to the finish line, but also like, you know, what are we doing? beyond there, right? To like continually like monitor and train these models. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, it goes beyond just training the model as well. I think training the model is important. Um, we, we hear a lot from customers and do I need my own LLM? Do I need to have my own personalized LLM? And, and that's not always the case, um, to get the, you know, the results that are, that are needed. So I think, you know, it is important to have, um, the right information grounding the responses and to have the ability to, um, inform the prompts properly, uh, that is critically important. But you don't always need to have, you know, our customers don't always need to have uh, their their own personalized LLM to be successful. So I think that that's an important distinction too. They really need to understand when that's important, why that's important, and um, when is it just a matter of making sure that the information that's being used to ground on to get the right answers back um, you know, is, is the main focus that they should be looking into, like making sure the quality of the data that's going in and being used by AI is actually, you know, is actually high and, um, and having good processes in place. I think you're mentioning, you know, having good processes in place to make sure that that is over time, continuing to stay high quality is critically important. Unfortunately, we are now at the end of our time for this session. I want to give a big thanks to our speakers, Tim Watt with PwC. Devra Struzenberg with Salesforce, thank you so much for your expertise and insights. I feel like we've scratched the surface, but it's a great start. And I, of course, I want to thank everyone who tuned in, all of our viewers. Thank you so much. <laughs>